Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here. Now, I, I know, first of all, some of you are thinking, what? It's a real seminar. It's not a virtual real seminar. Sorry about that, but we have to actually be here. Although maybe in the future we don't need to be here. Who knows? Uh, my name is Nick Greenfield. I'm head of tour operator relations at the European Tourism Association, also known as ITOA. Uh, and we're here today to speak for about half an hour with three fantastic panelists about what is virtual reality all about. Before I start by introducing them, I just want to give you something to think about. Uh, I believe some of you might know the famous British author, sadly no longer with us. His name was Douglas Adams. He wrote many wonderful books, including The Meaning of Lift and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And he said about virtual reality, he said, what the computer in virtual reality enables us to do is to recalibrate ourselves so that we start seeing those pieces of information that are invisible to us, but have become important for us to understand. And today, during this panel session, we will be tackling a little bit also the positive sides of virtual reality. But here in the travel industry, of course, we worry a little bit about virtual reality. Are there negative sides as well to the virtual experience? Right, let me start by introducing our three panelists. First of all, on the far side we have here today, we've got three Chris's here today, just to make it extra interesting for me. We have Chris Ball, who's the key account director at GLH Hotels. Then we have another Chris, Chris Howard, who's the senior director of business development at Matterport here. You're sitting here, sorry. And in the middle, we have Christoph Roos, who is the general manager for the Historium Brucker which is uh, a destination in Bruges where you can see a little bit about times past, I believe. So um, what I'd like to start with our panelists is each in turn, if you could just quickly introduce yourselves, say where you're from, and also what does virtual reality mean to you? Crispy, you've got a, an interesting looking piece of apparatus there. Could you start by telling us a little bit, firstly about yourself, your company, and what is virtuality at the moment, not in the future, at the moment, what does it mean to you? Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm Chris from GLH Hotels in London. We are London's uh, largest owner operator, 5,000 bedrooms across the city. Uh, virtual reality for us has become, as a, a sales tool, just a great way to showcase our properties at an event such as ITV. I can't say to somebody, go around the corner, go and see the hotel while you're in the city, because we only have hotels in London. Uh, with this particular app in here, it's a great way of saying it's not just a bedroom. You can go into the bedroom, you can see what's in there, you can walk around. There's descriptions of why that's there, what's in that room. You can walk around the hotel, you can walk up the stairs, you can go into the meeting rooms. You can see a lot more than you would on just a normal hotel show around. So for us, it's actually extending the, the reach of our sales team to be able to show people a lot more of the hotel without actually going there in the first place. Christoph, what does it mean for the Historium? Uh, for Historium, it means that we can take our visitors back into uh, 1435. We take them back on a time travel to uh, the golden age of Bruges, medieval times. Uh, during a 10 minutes virtual tour, we even put some uh, hand motions so they can interact with some medieval people by uh, saying hi. Uh, and that's just in addition to the Historium attraction that takes about 45 minutes. And then on plus, we have the eight or 10 minutes virtual reality experience. So you're saying they, they see the place initially, but they then see a virtual reconstruction of how it was, what, six centuries ago, you said? Yeah, 1435. Wow, yeah. okay. Has it changed much? That's not a serious question. No. Okay. <laughs> Chris H. Yeah. Tell us, what does it mean for Matterport? Sure, so Matterport is a company located in Silicon Valley, and we have a hardware software solution by which we create 3D models of real physical spaces. We can present those models on web, tablet, phone, and uh, another form is in VR. Um, and it's supported on Samsung uh, Gear VR. I have a Hawaiian villa you might be able to see after the show, um, Google Cardboard, and uh, Web VR with Google Daydream. And we have uh, the world's largest library of VR content, over 400,000 physical spaces. And uh, initially, we started primarily in residential real estate. We had a fair amount of organic uh, adoption in travel and hospitality, and I focused primarily in that category, working with hotels, tour operators, and vacation rentals. So you're basically providing the hardware and the software, the all-round wear, to make this virtual reality 
work and you work with a, a large degree of, of clients because you know we, we totally understand why maybe a historical site could recreate how it was back in 1435 you said back in 1435 but I mean your clients are they very varied do you find that you have a lot of people from different sectors in yes, the travel it's, industry it's very broad um, what's great is uh, we know the technology but invariably we end up learning about the best use cases from our partners and our clients they end up presenting executions we never thought about uh, in some instances most recently a partner would take a, uh, a model and actually create a duplicate where one model would be um, customer facing for sales and marketing and a second model would be back of the house that the facilities management team would use in order to understand the space. So um, the exciting part for us is um, people are using this in new and different ways and I'm learning from them. Okay, Christoph, can I go back to you for a minute? Okay, so I arrive at the Historium, I go back to 1435 and I think to myself, Okay, wow, I'm going to, to see uh, this, these, these sites and so forth. What sort of feedback do you get from your clients with this? How long have you had the virtual reality there for? And what sort of feedback do you get? And, do you, and can you give us examples of where you feel it's really, what is added, should we say, to your destination? Uh, we started experimenting with the virtual reality in 2014. So 2014, uh -huh. two and a half years ago. Uh, we implemented it, we started with the Labo, just to get some feedback from the customers, see how the hardware does, what was the response from the visitors, how did they react to it, they got motion sickness, uh, furthermore. In 2015, we implemented it in, uh, as a, a part of the historium, and it's something that, um, it's, it's a sequel to what they see in the historium attraction. So they, in the first attraction, they, we take them on the time travel to 1435, and they see how the Flemish primitives and how Bruges got so rich. And in the VR, we give them an extra, an extra value. We try to bring them along in all the cities they saw, or all the streets they saw in Bruges, but we constructed them, digitalized them, and put them back in virtual reality. For them, it's, it's, uh, it's also historical correct. We have lots of schools coming to visit us, not only the historian part, but more and more also the virtual reality part. So I think the added value is in the interaction between the historian and the virtual reality experience that we give them. And Chris, from a hotel point of view, what are you aiming to get with your virtual reality that you obviously also have this uh, rather wonderful headset there as well? Are you, are you allowing people to the tour, literally the whole hotel, maybe go in and say, oh, two pillows, I like two pillows, is that the idea? Or? That is absolutely it, to be able to showcase more of the property right. when you're actually outside of the hotel. So uh, you can see this later when we, when we get to play with it, but you walk through the front door of the hotel into the reception, you can go to the restaurant, you can go to the meeting rooms, you can go to the executive lounge, you can go literally every single space of the hotel has been covered. Uh, there's no way, well, back of house, obviously, you can't go there. But, uh, <laughs> you can't go look at the you accounts. You can't go in there. No, but okay, can't the, do it's that. very okay, easy sorry. to navigate around the hotel. You can't just stand with this on your head. You need to move around. You need to be active and, and say, I want to go upstairs. So you look up the stairs and you walk up the stairs. The great thing for, for us is really, if, for a meeting planner, for example, someone will come to the hotel and they will see a setup like this, you know, set up with 100 chairs out and a few tables. If you want to see it set up for a banquet or a conference or something else, we can't do that unless you get 20 people into the room to come and change around the setup and say, this is what it looks like. Looking at a photo now is a little bit boring. Ah. So to be able to go onto this and say, I want to see cabaret style, I want to see a banquet, you just click the button, go and change it. Three seats, you can see the full view of the room with various different options that you actually can't do in person. So, so for example, e-travel lab, maybe in the future, just a thought, uh, we could actually go and do a virtual reality tour of what it's like when there's a lot of people, a full audience, here to uh, talk to you. That'd be fantastic. Excellent. We will be opening out, by the way, later on to the audience for questions, so get ready with those burning questions. Um, my next question would be, obviously, virtual reality technology is changing quicker and quicker and quicker. Where do you see the next 12 months? What, what's the next big thing, do you think, in virtual reality? What's, 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 or what's developing in virtual reality? Because we're all quite familiar, I think, with using these headsets. Out of interest, who here has used one of these headsets to look at a destination in the audience? Oh, quite a lot of people. OK. Right, OK. Do you have your grandparents and parents do that as well? Sometimes the technology? Yeah, my mum loves it. Um, so what, where do you see things developing over the next 12 months? Sure, so there's two dimensions of um, development in the next 12 months. One is hardware and one is software. On the hardware side, uh, much of our capabilities are eliminated by, uh, uh, um, defined by the hardware manufacturers. And so whether it's Samsung, 
Apple, uh, Android, and so we're looking for them to increase capabilities, including resolution. On the software side, what we see is, with high engagement, the opportunity to um, take advantage of that, that attention of the user. So one example is, uh, later this year, we have annotations in our 3D models, being able to bring those annotations into virtual reality, which might even allow for uh, gamification, imagine a treasure hunt, in order to engage and give a reason for someone to continue to um, uh, explore a space. And then lastly, on our side, um, there's a fair amount of um, demand from our partners about analytics and data. So imagine as many users go through space and uh, virtual reality, the ability to understand their choices that they make in space and aggregate that and how that informs the way we think about those uh, folks as we're uh, selling and marketing to them. So with, without getting all too involved with the whole, audience, uh, with the whole uh, panel here, would that, for example, be something for a hotel, for example, where you could, other Chris, could possibly go and could look and say, OK, I noticed people are doing virtual tours of my hotel, and they seem particularly interested in the restaurant, for example, because it's got a beautiful view. That's where you would do the analytics. You would see how people's virtual visits of a place where they top up, where, where the people are really paying attention. Is that what you're saying? Yes, we, we talk about um, both space recognition and object recognition. Space recognition being a bathroom versus a bedroom versus a kitchen, and object recognition being a refrigerator uh, versus l looking at a sink, and the ability to be able to track any of those events uh, for user attention, and then how that informs us. OK. Christoph. What are your plans for the next 12 months? You, you, have, they, you say it's 10 to 12 minutes at the moment that they spend doing this virtual visit back in 1435. Yep. You're going to look at another date maybe, or maybe um, add some mad crazy people with swords? Or, I don't know, I'm just already, asking. We already launched that. So we had a problem that... You, you have people with swords already? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> there you had it here first. People with swords. We, uh, we had the same problem as Nick. So 12 months for us is way too long. Because we use it in a commercial setup, people have to pay a fee to get a virtual reality experience, so it has to always deliver quality. And for the moment, it's very hard to find a good hard, uh, piece of hardware that will hold for 12 months. So uh, we, we didn't find it until now. Uh, we tried different. We had the Samsung Gear. We have the uh, Oculus DK1, the DK2. Now we have the Oculus Rift, the production model. But even after six months, we see that the, the quality tends to sink. Right. And they, they, they start to break. Okay. So instead of looking forward for 12 months, uh, we just tried, we just launched uh, uh, our, the same historian virtual reality experience. We made a game out of it. I mean, put it on Steam. We made it for the HoloLens, for the Oculus, and for the HTC Vive. We put it on Steam. It sells okay. Uh, but it's more for us, it's more interesting for us to get feedback from the people, from the community, instead of just releasing it to our visitors, because for them it's all brand new. So the, the feedback from them is, it's interesting, we like it, it's affordable, but the, the feedback we get from the people on the, the VR community is more interesting in, in guiding us in a certain direction. So the message there is rather than just trying to create something and hoping that people will be into it, actually you have already some product, yep. see what they think about that. Do you ask them also in the future what they might like to see some more of? Or? Um, I'm, I'm, for the moment, it, it will be more in the directions of uh, HoloLens, augmented right. reality, instead okay. of virtual reality. Okay, yeah. got you. And at the hotel, next 12 months, are you, gonna, are you going to add to the experiences you can get? Have you yeah, got other ideas? There's quite a lot we want to do with it in the next 12 months. The main thing is getting all of our hotels on here. At the moment, we've just got one particular brand. Right. Uh, GLH has got five brands. We want to get all the hotels on there to be able to showcase it. Uh, the next stage, and I think Christoph does some of this when we spoke briefly before, is to make it more interactive. So at the moment when we're, when we're exhibiting, someone's got the, this on their head, we plug it into the screen. It creates a real buzz. People are interested and they want to see what you're looking at so everyone can see it on the screen. The next stage is then gloves. So rather than looking at a wardrobe and it tells you what's in the wardrobe, or you look at the mini bar and this tells you what's there, it's actually opening it yourself. So you'll be able to walk around the room, open the doors, and actually just make it a lot more interactive than, than, it, than it currently is. The other side of the next 12 months is really interesting with what, with what Chris said, is the analytics behind it. Because what we do when we go to see our clients is we leave the Google Cardboard boxes with them. They download the app on their iPhones or on the Samsung, so they can, we can leave it with the, the customers and they can go back and have a look whenever they like. What we want to see is what they're looking at. I'm, I, I leave 20 Google boxes in the States, for example, and then that's it. I leave the boxes there, they play with the app. 
I don't know what they're looking at. I'd like to know if they're sticking in the restaurant. I'd like to know if they're hovering around the executive lounge so that we know what, what people are actually interested in while they're using it. So there's, there's developments we want to use physically for the sales team, but also in the background to be able to say, hang on, this is what the customers are using it for. Okay, so you're actually using it to see what appeals almost about your hotels. Absolutely, yeah. Presumably in some places, it's the yeah. minibar. That's what people are looking at first of all with their, there's their virtual gloves. There's so. probably around 1,000 of the Google Cardboard boxes now around the world in travel agencies and things like that. People are using our app. We just don't know what they're using it for. Okay, so that would be a next step yeah. as well. Interesting. Well, maybe I'm sure you guys will talk afterwards. So uh, anyway, uh, let me ask the obvious question here. I'm, I, I don't know, I might be wrong in saying this, but I feel that in the travel industry, my, my heart has sank in the years past as a guide when I had uh, young American students who come over here and they almost were, why am I here? I kind of, my family wants me to come. I could do this at home was almost the attitude. And I know also in some countries, uh, there's always been a concern that some virtual reality is so impressive that will virtual reality actually end up replacing travel itself? Now, it sounds from all of you, no, the point about virtual reality is to get people more excited, to get them to understand better, rather than giving a classic catalog or some photos, like you said. Do you see any potential negative sides of overuse or just in general of virtual reality? Chris, I'll start with you as the... I expect you to say no, obviously, but uh, you, might, you might see potentially for some of the people here in the audience where virtual reality could be not the right thing to be using. Um, we're in the middle of the virtual reality ecosystem, and I'll still tell you, you should use it responsibly, which is to say it's part of a conversation. So with most of our partners, they're using it in face-to-face -face direct sales conversations, whether they're tour operators um, on the hotel side, particularly with uh, group meeting and conference spaces with large uh, sales opportunities. And more than anything, those, relation those are relationships and conversations. Um, an example with one of our partners at IMAX last quarter in Las Vegas is they would start the conversation with Google Cardboard, invite their uh, client to go through the space in virtual reality, uh, then move to the iPad, and then put all of that aside and they continue the conversation just one-on-one. -on -one. So ultimately it's a tool, and the question for you is how to fit that into your conversations with clients and ultimately get back to um, building the relationship. So you could potentially become a bit too obsessed by it and not using it, as you just said, a tool. I think that might be the key word there, that you're using it to move towards something, not in an end in itself. Is that a fair? Precisely. If your client uses this and then says thank you and leaves, you, you have, you <laughs> have mismanaged the conversation. Got you. That's a very good tip, I think. Christoph, how about yourself as this uh, wonderful historical, because there is still real bricks and mortar at the Historian. We all know Bruges is this wonderful jewel of a, of a medieval city. And you mentioned your, your, your eight to 10 minutes uh, visit. Do you see any dangers in, uh, in using the, uh, or is it fantastic for a place like you? It, it is fantastic for the, the people visiting Historium and doing the VR experience. For us as an organizer, it's, it's not so fantastic. Uh, apart from the hardware and the software problems, it also has a practical problems. People hear about virtual reality, but they, they haven't experienced it yet. So for us, it's hard to sell. Right. That's the first part. Uh, and also, now we're, we're bouncing up in some boundaries. For instance, we had uh, the hand activity, so they can pick up uh, uh, apples from a bucket and, and throw them to medieval persons. Uh, before that, they just sit still. So we made a boot of a... 80 by uh, 50. So you've made it more interactive yes. than it was before. It, more, it was more like 3D cinema. No. Okay. Uh, but now we see that people tend to just grab the apples and throw them away, hitting down <laughs> their uh, neighbors or uh, touching the, the, the boot itself. So we have to adjust that for the next time we do an update. So you're actually encouraging medieval style violence at the yes. Historian Brooker, is of what you course. say, with your virtual reality. It's, it's better it, to, uh, to do that in virtual reality than in, uh, than in reality real itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and as a hotel, do you see any dangers? I, I think there's a couple of dangers. Some are professional dangers. Some of them are personal. So if you've got people playing with swords, that's going to get interesting. Uh, <laughs> with I, was, I took this out to Minneapolis this time last year. When you've got people at a wine reception and they've had four glasses of wine and then they're playing with this, it gets quite interesting to see what's going on. The, the other danger Sorry, is... Sorry, in what way? 
Uh, it, I have to ask. People, people want to know. People walking around with this, with a glass of wine in their hand, and then walking into walls, and all it just gets very messy. Oh right, but, uh, so industrial accidents, courtesy of virtual reality. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Then I don't want to res res be responsible for that. The other danger of, uh, as we know, the industry, it's people. Whether it's a hotelier or a wholesaler or an attraction, it's still about the people. We don't want to take away from the relationship we've got with people and replace it with technology. It's there as an add-on. Mm -hmm. The example of when not to use a virtual reality is that, again, this time last year, I was in the hotel that's featured on this, and he, the guy, the hotel manager, is stood there showing a load of his clients the hotel on this. I'm like, you're in the hotel. You go upstairs. Go and show the bedroom. Go and show them the property. You don't need to use this when you are there. It's been Incredible. So you're actually yeah. in the hotel with all the goggles on. Absolutely, yeah. Amazing. It's like you're looking around the lobby, that you, you're stood in the lobby. You don't need to look at it on there. So <laughs> there, there's, there's times, obviously, like now, I can show people the properties. There's other times, stick to what we know best. And say what traditional. actually Absolutely, exists. yeah. About the talking to your clients and, and selling properly without a tool. Okay. Before I go any further, are there any questions out there in the audience initially? I believe there's a microphone around there somewhere. It may actually be a virtual audience. I'm very sorry about that. I could have yes, the gentleman over here. Do we have the uh, the mic? Hello. Do we have the uh, radio mic? I'll tell you what, can I borrow that very quickly? Oh, it's over there. Hello. Good. There we go. Hello. Yes. Is it on? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, my name's Stephen from Time Rift Tours. Uh, we're doing something very interesting, uh, very similar to what you're doing. Uh, we're doing live tours in virtual reality, and we've developed a Berlin Wall, and it's given by our tour guide partners who are when in Berlin, so if anybody wants a tour. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in all three of you. What are you using uh, to create the scenes? Is it live rendering? Is it photogrammetry? Is it a mixture of photographs? Or w how are you producing your scenes? How are you creating the content? Very yeah, good exactly. question. Thank you very much. You said this is in Berlin, your tours? Yeah. It's, uh, uh, and are you going back to pre the wall or to certain yeah, it's, periods it's, in history? It, it's the Berlin Wall through three different time periods. Gotcha. And we have a platform that allows the tour guide to control it. So they can annotate it and guide you through different years. So if but, you think of but, but resume, you don't have them on all the time. Like, like Chris said, you know, you, you, you see how it is now, and then you put it on to yeah. then go and, OK. And you compare and contrast. And, and like yeah. uh, someone mentioned, like a lot of, I think it was yourself, a lot of people come here and they don't get the concept. And when you put on the glasses, it's they Douglas see Adams. exactly what a wall it's is. It's the information that's invisible to us. Exactly, exactly. Very much. Douglas Adams, always quotable. <laughs> uh, could each of you answer the gentleman's question about how you make content? I can answer that one really easily, just to jump in, because uh, I'm the salesperson. So I asked my marketing team to do this for me, and they said yes. Oh, as simple as that. You say, do it for you. I and have then, got no and idea how we made it. I just use it. OK, fantastic. Christoph, do you know about how you make the content? Do you, uh, who do you hire certain people? Uh, we had the, it's all computer animated. Do you have any live actors that you film and then create, or is it all literally computer it's all, animated? No, uh, uh, okay. Uh, so each cobblestone that you see in the streets of Bruges and all the medieval buildings we had to reconstruct in, uh, uh, in virtual reality. Oh, wow. Yeah, and whole... we, had a, we have a historical committee that, uh, because Bruges is very protective about what they do, about the, the, how Bruges looks like, so we had to propose how we will do it and if uh, according to old paintings and old maps and old you know, so it wasn't easy so they were they were potentially concerned that your historical content may not be accurate yeah that they may look bruges of 1435 look a little bit dodgy or wrong yep. or uh, 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 okay it's interesting that after <laughs> do we have any destination marketeers here i wonder because there's there's a lesson for you be careful about how you project yourself from 600 years ago what about content yourself at matterport so um we produce the content through our, it's a camera that's about the size of a toaster, and uh, it operates with your own iPad, and you literally press a button on your iPad, the camera rotates 360 degrees in about 45 seconds, then you pick up the tripod, move it about 10 feet, and do it again. That's how you capture a space. The great part, it's very low cost of capture, so it doesn't require a professional photographer. Our camera captures both visual data and depth data, and from that, after you upload it to the cloud, we create a 3D model um, that uh, it's a fair amount of rich data. And with that 3D model, you can either explore it in a 3D model or in a virtual reality. It's very, uh, it's very easy to do. Within about five or 10 minutes, you can qualify people. Um, that's why many people, like in a hotel, there might be as many as a half dozen folks who are qualified to operate the camera and move it within various spaces. Nice. Do we have any other questions out there out of interest in the audience over here? Yes, the lady here. Do we have a mic? Yes, the gentleman's just coming here. Hi, I just have a quick question. I haven't tried virtual reality yet, but oh. I would really like to. <laughs> and my question is, 
can you combine the real what we have around us with virtual reality. So if I put the glasses on, I can still see you, but there's a lot of stuff around you, for example. Ah, so, so can you mix it up a little bit? So we could see the interior of Hall 7.1C, but we could start to see people in medieval costume in the audience and probably get a bit freaked out. But uh, are you able to do that? Or is it very much once you put the headset on, it's just uh, what's in the computer? For the moment, it's all, uh, we only work with virtual reality, so that includes an Oculus. Uh, so you put on the glasses and you just see the virtual world. The game we just uh, launched also worked for the HoloLens. With the HoloLens, you can, I can make, if everybody puts on the HoloLens who's sitting in the audience, you will see each other, you will see me and Nick and the other two Nicks, but you always, you can, we can make it that it's a big whale just swimming across the audience or that uh, the ceiling is just tumbling down. So it's really an, a, a mixed reality, augmented reality. So that's also possible. Fantastic. So, um, with virtual reality, there's also the c conversation very often about augmented reality. And so most of our work today is in virtual reality, a, a, uh, a very faithful representation of uh, physical spaces. Um, we're uh, looking into it on a roadmap, um, particularly as it relates to um, refurnishing spaces. So imagine if you're thinking about decorating and you have a physical space in 3D and you want to consider perhaps different couches or other, um, other ways to design it. In that sense, we're, that's what we're probably most recently thinking about pulling in the AR. Okay, very quickly, because we're near the end. Chris, I think thoughts? it's a very simple one for us. Once the headset's on, the headset's on. You, you're in the room, you're away. End of story. You're out of the world and you're into the headset. Okay, we're almost done here. Very quickly, one word or five word answer. Do you think that virtual reality will continue to be positive for travel, or is there a danger it's going to replace travel? What do you no, think? No, I think it's, it's going to be positive from my perspective as an extension to what we currently use to sell the hotels. The, the old school way of selling will never go away. It's just a great tool for us to be able to use. It's an inspiration. Absolutely, yeah. Christoph, in your case? Yeah, only positive. Only positive. Because you need to be in the historical spot to really enjoy. And finally, Chris. Uh, it inspires and engages, which ultimately leads its, uh, to conversations. Hopefully, uh, people will travel more and think about where they're going. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not be familiar, but there's a very tight schedule here. In a couple of minutes, there'll be a fantastic next session. And I can feel already virtual gaze. Oh, no, it's a real gaze coming over here from the left-hand side. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Um, just a couple of words about where you can talk to any of our panelists. In a minute, we're going to, in reality, go behind here. There's a little lounge. We'll be hanging there for a few minutes if any of you are interested. Alternatively, either because you're staying here for further sessions or you want to come and find us later, the ETOA stand is in Hall 9. I know for some of you, Hall 9? There's a Hall 9? Yes, Hall 9, just down here on the right-hand side. Uh, stand 320. I know that Matterport will be over there at our stand to show you a little bit and talk to you about how these things work. So come and find us there and also to find information from any of our panelists here today. And it just leaves me to thank and also ask you to give a quick round of applause to our fantastic people. A real one.